Securities joins me now to discuss the week that was. Uh, in particular, Mark, thanks for your time this morning. Let's talk about these geopolitical risks that we did see, uh, especially towards the end of last week. And now this morning, uh, another police shooting in the USA. Uh, at least three police officers are dead uh, in what looks to be a multiple shooter incident uh, based obviously on the reaction to the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, on top of that, we obviously had that awful tragedy in Nice uh, towards the end of last week uh, and what we're seeing in Turkey, this attempted coup that seems to have been thwarted, although there will be uh, further ramifications, you would think. How are the markets reacting to all of this information? Are we moving back to a, a risk-off environment, the flight to safe havens? How does that continue, do you think? Yeah, good morning, Carrington. I mean, I, th I think it certainly puts uh, the geopolitical risks back on the radar um, from investors, which uh, I think we're enjoying a, a, a risk on rally um, during the last few weeks. Uh, having said that, you know, I guess the, the US Treasuries, which obviously did close before you saw um, the, the real uh, news from Turkey come through, they backed up two basis points, 10 years in the US to 155. And that was around about 15 basis points uh, higher on the week. And that is the kind of the worst performance uh, since June 2015. Uh, I think you probably see some reversal of that um, during the, the next uh, few days, as I think in investors just maybe pull back a bit of their risk appetite just to see the developing, as you say, situation in Turkey and how that does play out. Um, so a lot of moving parts over there. And I think investors will probably, you know, given where equities are trading at the moment, look to maybe take a bit of money off the table. And you may see some profit taking. And also you probably see um, uh, government bonds, uh, sovereign bonds do, do particularly well as maybe there's a, a bit of a flight to safety coming on uh, uh, during the first uh, few days of this week. We haven't seen yet really the impact of Turkey in particular, Mark, flow through to markets. Uh, maybe some of the FX trading, uh, it flowed through a little bit in commodities trading. Do you, do you think that now that we're at a situation where it looks like the coup has been thwarted uh, by the president, uh, by the ruling party, that it effectively is a non-event as far as markets are concerned? Or does it just point out the instability that this country is dealing with? This is a NATO ally. It's on the border of uh, between Europe um, and the Middle East, which is obviously dealing with civil wars uh, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, did, did, is it now still a live issue, do you think? How do you think it's going to be absorbed? Yeah, look, I, I, think, I think the situation is a lot better than it looked initially uh, as we kind of woke up on uh, our Saturday morning and saw the, saw the news. Um, and it looks like they've got the situation more under control than uh, was probably originally thought. I, I don't think this is a non-event. I think it will just, you know, put that whole region back on the uh, investors' radar in terms of that uh, political risk. And I think it will just make them a bit more cautious going forward that these risks, um, you know, are around in that region and will continue to be so. Um, I think you'll see a, a bit of a flight to safety. I think you'll see some buyers of uh, government bonds and probably a bit of uh, safe haven uh, uh, buying in terms of the currencies, probably see the, uh, the US dollar uh, a bit stronger and potentially the yen as well uh, as we move out of the, the, the euro. Um, I think as well, you know, in terms of, um, you know, how that situation develops will obviously um, depend on, uh, you know, investor sentiment and that will be a key driver of that going forward, especially in the early part of the week. But, you know, the Australian and, and the Asian markets will be the, the first markets really to be able to react to the news and it'll be interesting to see what happens. But my feeling is that you'll see a bit of a risk off and uh, safe haven flows coming through on the back of the, uh, the news out of Turkey. Uh, in the UK, Mark, we've seen uh, the new Prime Minister, Theresa May, try to consolidate her power, if you will, or stamp her authority on the government. She met with Nicholas Sturgeon, the First Minister in Scotland. It was an interesting meeting. I mean, a, an amazing photo there. These two women now leading uh, both the UK Parliament, but also um, the devolved powers in, the, in Scotland, meeting for the first time in their official capacities. <laughs> Theresa's main commentary I thought was interesting, though. She seemed to indicate that she only wanted to look at initiating Article 50, which is the formal step that the UK needs to take in order for the Brexit to actually br begin, for the negotiations to officially start, according to the European Union, at least and suggesting that Scot keeping Scotland within the UK was a critical aim for her and that she wanted them to be on the same page before they do it. Does this effectively mean that Scotland does have a veto on the Brexit? Is that what she was trying to indicate? Or does a Brexit, as she had said originally, mean Brexit? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, it's, a, it's a very fascinating situation and there's been, you know, a lots of legal opinion about in terms of what the uh, Scottish veto actually means. Um, you know, is it legally binding? Does Scotland have to 
uh, come along with the UK as well. Um, and this is you know, still to play out by, um, by as we go through into uh, the, you know, the coming months. But in terms of the negotiations, in terms of the negotiations that uh, Theresa May wants to do with the trading partners before triggering Article 50, we're still looking, you know, even if the Scotland situation does resolve itself and the UK is allowed to um, actually exit, and there's still you know, legal opinions that say the UK Parliament still has to vote on triggering Article 50 and pass an act of parliament, and it's not clear whether that would still go through. And, and uh, elsewhere, you've got the, um, the, the uh, Labour Party uh, leadership debate continuing as well, with uh, some candidates saying, look, you know, potentially they may take it to uh, the, uh, the general electorate in terms of whether they want to really, on a second, second thoughts, actually leave the uh, European Union. So there's a lot of moving parts there. Even if Brexit does happen, this is not going to happen until you know, 2018, 2019 potentially, and it's a long, going to be a long, drawn-out process with you know, lots of bumps and lots of uncertainties along the way. But I think in the meantime, I think uh, investors will probably, UK investors will probably take a bit of comfort that you know, that it potentially the UK may not actually leave the uh, the European Union. Well, and, and then the time frame on this is interesting, isn't it? That Theresa May now indicating she always said that she wanted to wait until 2017. There is now talk that in order to really stamp her authority on the government, the only way you can do that is by going to the public, going for a general election, calling a snap election, as it were. Do you think that that's in their thought process? They have these fixed terms. Do you think they'll take the, the step of actually going back to the people in order to get a mandate for these negotiations? I, I think I'd be su surprised, Carrington, if they did go to uh, a general election in the next six months. I think they'd, look, the, the, as far as uh, Theresa May is concerned, you know, the UK has voted, um, Brexit means Brexit. I think it's quite right that she's taken her time to kind of get the pre-negotiations out of the way and uh, some kind of uh, formal or informal framework in terms of how these discussions will uh, uh, go forward and in terms of the, the key uh, negotiation uh, points that they want to achieve before they trigger that Article 50. Because once the Article 50 is triggered, it does set that two-year limited time frame to get everything else, uh, all the ducks lined up in terms of all the negotiations. So the UK, quite rightly, will want to take its time to make sure that it is on the right path. It knows what it's trying to achieve in those uh, two years, because as we not all know, those two years will pass very, very quickly. Uh, as, that, as that clock ticks down until the formal exit of the UK to, um, leaving the EU, if that is the path that they do go, go down. And as you say, it's not clear at this stage whether that is exactly the path they'll take. Uh, I, but I still think that the Conservatives will probably, and Theresa May will try to keep the government uh, as is uh, with the mandate that she's received from the referendum and try to negotiate as best she can uh, with the various trading partners and, and the various other legislation, as well as Scotland, without triggering that uh, general election. Uh, let's uh, turn our attention to one of the other points of interest in Europe at the moment, as if there wasn't enough. And this is the continuing uh, deterioration, really, in the situation in the banking system in Italy. A, a huge flare-up of uh, media attention over the weekend, many suggesting that this could be a much bigger risk uh, for the Eurozone than the Brexit was, even what's happening with Turkey as far as keeping, um, keeping them all together on this issue. Where are we at the moment? What, what, is, what is, are we thinking is the, the starting point uh, for how this is going to work or, or the, 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 the main way it's going to play out, the most likely outcome, versus what are the extremes? Could this potentially bring the financial system uh, again crashing to its knees? There's always that potential once we start talking about the, the financial system uh, in terms of Italy and its links into France and, and uh, into Germany as well. There's, there's um, all kinds of cross um, holdings there. In terms of the specific Italian situation, there's around about 360 billion uh, of, of bad loans on the Italian banks' balance sheets. And I think it's the, uh, the Daily Telegraph or the Sunday Telegraph in the UK reporting that uh, JP Morgan has been given the mandate to try to establish a bad bank, and that will be initially have 10 billion euros of capital in that bad bank. And they will look to, to basically take off around about 50 billion of those um, bad uh, bank loans off the balance sheets of the banks. Um, and obviously that means that they're gonna be buying those at around about 20 cents in the dollar. So highly uh, stressed and distressed loans. Uh, and that will hopefully free up the, uh, the existing banks to start to, to make loans again going forward. Now, 
as we've talked about previously, the, the, the really critical point here is whether the European Union will allow such a bail-in to take, take place without, um, first of all, triggering uh, capital losses on the equity holders and some creditors further up the capital structure, whether that's uh, hybrid holders, subordinated bond holders, uh, senior bond holders. And you know, we did see in, in Cyprus the extreme situation where depositors also were effectively bailed in as well. So that negotiations are, are, are continuing. But the, uh, as, as I say, the, the UK press is, is reporting that JP Morgan has been awarded that mandate to try to establish a bad bank to try to clear up the situation there. And hopefully if they can do that, that will prevent any kind of uh, systemic shock to the, uh, the European banking system, which I agree I think is a bigger risk than the, uh, the Brexit vote. Mark Bailey, thank you for your insights. Thanks, Carrington. We're going to take a short break here on Market.